Uh, no one in this audience need be told that my theme this evening is not a novel one. Whether and if so in what respects human behavior is marked by features that distinguish it from behavior of other living things, in what way and to what extent the actions of men are dependent on processes over which men have little, if any, control, and in what sense, if any, human beings have the capacity for making decisions that can properly be called their own, uh, as well as the extent to which they can be held responsible or accountable for what they do. These are recurrent questions in the history of Western philosophy and have been discussed with subtlety and frequently with great passion by outstanding thinkers since Greek antiquity. Nevertheless, these questions continue to be topical and are currently at the center of much lively philosophical debate, both among professional philosophers as well as among scientists, theologians, literary men, and many thoughtful individuals in public life. One thing that can be safely said about my theme is that it has been a perennial concern to men in all walks of life, that I will not exhaust the subject this evening, and that though answers to the questions associated with it are numerous, the questions manage to survive the proposed answers that have been given to it and appear as if freshly born to almost every generation. It may nevertheless seem puzzling why an issue that was raised at least 2,000 years ago and to which so many thinkers have addressed themselves has not long since been finally resolved, but on the contrary persists as an acutely felt problem and continues to receive active attention from philosophically reflective minds. This fact is certainly worth a brief comment, especially if one believes, as I myself do, that generally satisfactory answers to the issue have been repeatedly given throughout the centuries, so that its discussion continues despite what I believe are in principle adequate resolutions of it. In any event, there are a number of reasons which help make intelligible the persistence of the problem among which the following seem to me the more important ones. In the first place, new information about the conditions under which human beings can continue to operate often throws the problem into a fresh perspective and appears to challenge the adequacy of previous discussions of the question. For example, our understanding of the mechanisms that are involved in human action has been enriched by developments in this century, in our knowledge of biological heredity, in endocrin endocrin endocrinology, in medicine, in psychological learning theory, and the formation of human personality, and whether or not one accepts as well established the Freudian account of the way in which the behavior of adults is affected uh, by the experiences they've had in childhood, there's certainly no doubt Freudian ideas have been profoundly influential and have modified widely held conceptions of human nature. So, in consequence of such changed views concerning the mechanisms that are involved in the behavior of the human organism, it is not at all strange that reflective men should reconsider the question whether human beings do in fact have the powers or the capacities that are often attributed to them and perhaps find that in the light of advances in knowledge, previous discussions of human freedom and human responsibility are obsolete. Secondly, the past 50 years have witnessed the gradual relaxation of the hold that a number of theories of social development have had upon the minds of many thinkers. In particular, the notion of a necessary sequence of stages through which all societies must pass, a notion associated with attempted applications of evolutionary theory and biology to social processes, or the conception of historical inevitability that is part of one widely held interpretation of Marxian doctrine, has each been found to be seriously inadequate. However, many students reacting vigorously to such theories of inevitable social change 
have come to believe that a common premise underlying all such theories is the view that human actions are all contingent on determining conditions over which men allegedly have no control. And they have therefore come to the conclusion that it is, it is this broad, comprehensive assumption of a universal determinism which must be freshly reconsidered and indeed in the light of the inadequacies of all theories of historical inevitability must itself be rejected. Thirdly and finally, contemporary advances in psychological and social science have not only improved our understanding of the mechanisms which support human behavior, but have also given rise to techniques for directing such behavior to conform to selected ends. There has, as a consequence, been generated what I think is a far from baseless fear that progress in the so-called behavioral sciences will lead to the development of ever more powerful techniques which will enable those conversant with them to manage men as just so many pawns in a satanical game. In consequence, many sensitive men who prize human individuality have acquired a deep distrust, if not hatred, for science and all its works. And quite apart from any motivations they may have to disprove theories of historical inevitability, they have sought to establish some theoretical limits to the scope of science in its effort to discover the co causal determinants of human action. Accordingly, in the attempt to make fully secure the conception of human beings as free agents and to prevent the exclusion of all moral consideration from consideration of human affairs, which is a tendency that at least some uh, professed scientists exhibit, uh, many thinkers have advanced what they believe are conclusive arguments against determinism as a universal thesis, arguments which in some cases are based on developments in contemporary physics, though quite frequently the arguments used are adaptations of quite old philosophical analyses. Well, all this by way of preliminary. So let me state now briefly how I propose to treat the theme of this lecture. My central aim is to show that there is no incompatibility between the claim that human beings are or can be free or responsible agents, a claim to which I myself subscribe, and the assumption, which I think is sound, that there are determining or causal conditions under which men engage in responsible action and manifest their, what is often called, their freedom of will. I am, moreover, strongly persuaded that many contemporary attacks on determinism are misguided and mistaken, and that the rejection of determinism in the interest of establishing the reality of the efficacy of human choice is actually a case of throwing out the baby with bathwater that is not even dirty. Indeed, I'm convinced that the attempt to set theoretical limits to the province of scientific inquiry, which is so often part and parcel of the attempt to disprove determinism, is an invitation to obscurantism and a genuine threat to the growth of knowledge and the spread of liberal intelligence. And so I want, first of all, to clear up some misconceptions about determinism <clears throat> by indicating briefly what is the actual content and cognitive status of the principle of determinism. I want to examine some current assumptions directed to showing that human action is not determined. And thirdly, I'd like to explain why I think that the effective reality of human freedom is entirely compatible with the supposition that human actions do have causal determinants. So let me turn first to the question, what is determinism? And let me begin by mentioning what I think are really misconceptions, and I think the best way of doing that is to quote the views that have been expressed by some uh, uh, fairly distinguished men who have thought about this subject. For example, a contemporary Dutch historian, ra rather distinguished uh, historian indeed, uh, Peter Heil, in a book published a few years ago, in giving an account of what he understood by determinism, he said, according to the deterministic doctrine, we, that is we human beings, are helplessly caught in the grip of a movement proceeding from all 
that has gone before. Early in the 19th century, William Godwin, the father-in-law of poet Shelley, commenting on determinism and applying it to familiar situation, remarked that the assassin cannot help the murder any more than a dagger which the assassin yields. Just as the dagger is simply being manipulated by the assassin and itself is not responsible, so the assassin himself is being manipulated on the assumption that the actions of human beings have causal conditions. Or take a different sort of a, a, a writer, the late Clarence Darrow, who was very prominent in defending men accused of murder, uh, often used uh, very persuasively an argument that no individual really was responsible for what he did. And he said, for example, back of every murder and back of every human act are sufficient causes that move the human machine beyond their control. You may not yourself see exactly why it was you did this thing, but if you look at the question deeply enough and carefully enough, you will see that there were circumstances that drove you to do exactly the thing which you did. You could not help it anymore then we outside can help taking the positions that we take. Now, if one were to examine carefully these and other quotations from people who have considered determinism, whether favorably or otherwise, and ask what are the assumptions that are implicit in these statements, I think perhaps the following can be easily identified. First of all, there is a supposition uh, that according to these views of determinism, there's something that we might call the self, which may be, but not is always considered as being distinct from the body, is a self which is constrained to behave by things outside the self, and is in some sense helpless to do anything else. Secondly, there is an implicit assumption then that if determinism is true, there is no originative power in anything. And that the things which behave, uh, whether they are inanimate things or whether they are living things, and in particular with the human beings, that things' behavior are simply the outcome of impacts, collisions upon it by other things. And thirdly, and I think perhaps philosophically this is the most important and most interesting assumption, the assumption, namely, that if there is some entity or some property which, is, which can be analyzed into a set of elements that are related in certain ways, then the entity or property which has been analyzed is in some sense thereby have, has been shown to be unreal or in some sense not ultimate. Since I'm I want to dis uh, return to this last point, uh, considered at some length, I want to uh, here simply give an illustration of the sort of thing that I have in mind in mentioning it. There is a well-known book which at one time was widely sold, I'm not sure that it was widely read, by the late the outstanding British astronomer Sir Arthur Eddington, a book called The Nature of the Physical World, uh, which is extremely well written and starts out with a few prefatory remarks before he gets into the details of modern physics and starts out in what appears to be a very paradoxical fashion. He says, I sit down to write these lectures and I draw up two tables. One table is the familiar common sense table, which is permanent, substantial, is colored, has a certain texture when you touch it, and so on. 
This is the familiar table. And then there's also the scientific table. That is, it's the table as conceived according to modern physics, which, as Eddington describes it, is made up of rapidly moving electrical charges whose mean distances, that is, the mean distances between them are extremely large compared to the dimensions of the electric charges, so that the scientific table, as unlike the common sense table, which seems to be voluminous and substantial and solid, the scientific table is mostly emptiness, and moreover it has no color, it has no texture, and so on. The contrast between what appears to common sense with what apparently appears when it's analyzed from the perspective of modern physics. And according to Eddington, one really had to settle the question, which of these was the real table? And he, like many others, came to the conclusion that since you've analyzed the common sense table in the way just briefly indicated, the common sense table really wasn't real, that the real object was the sort of thing that was uh, discovered and described by theories of modern physics. That is, the assumption underlying these quotations and these conceptions of determinism, and I, as I say, I like to return to this because uh, many of the arguments against determinism hinge very centrally upon this tacit assumption is that uh, once you can analyze an entity or a concept and show that it is a structure of certain other elements standing to each other certain relations, then the thing with which you started somehow diminishes its status in reality. Or if I may use a very simple example, uh, we are long, I, I take it long before we are introduced some elements of geometry. We may have come to recognize that some figures are similar to other figures and other, some figures are not. And so the notion of figures being similar is a, a fairly familiar notion which we, we have acquired, I, I take it, at least many of us have, before we began to study geometry formally. And then you find a definition in uh, uh, elementary books in geometry would say that, well, if we want to give a definition of similar figures, for example, similar triangles, we say two triangles are similar if their corresponding angles are equal and the corresponding sides are in proportion. Now, notice in the definition, no mention is made of the triangles, no mention is made of similarity. That term appears to drop out. All you have is equality of angles. You have proportionality of sides or proportionality of, of line segments. And if one were to take the position that I'm now trying to characterize, one would say, well, since we've analyzed the notion of similarity into a complex of relation between elements different from those to which we normally attribute the predicate of being similar, uh, similarity itself has lost a grip or a status in reality. Now, these, I think, are misconceptions of what determinism is. I want to now say very briefly uh, what determinism, if it is taken seriously as uh, uh, something either asserted or implied by modern science, perhaps amounts to. And perhaps the best way is to begin with an illustration, not too difficult. Uh, this could be worked out in a great deal of technical details, but there's neither time nor the occasion for this. Uh, I suppose the most familiar deterministic system with which uh, most of us are familiar is uh, the solar system. And if you think of the solar system in this way, that say, well, it's made up of a certain number of elements, planets, the sun, perhaps comets, uh, and you're considering certain characteristics of the system, for example, the positions of these elements, their velocities, uh, the orbits that they travel on, 
uh, we find the following sort of situation, that if you specify a certain number of variables, such as position, velocity, masses, energy of the system, and so on, if we call these things variables, suppose now that at a given time the solar system exhibited a certain special form of these variables, that the planets, for example, were in certain positions and were moving with certain velocities along certain orbits, and then after a, a certain interval of time, for example, two months, you permit the system to develop of its own, it's isolated from the influence of everything else, and that after two months, for example, the planets are in a different position and moving with different speeds uh, and having different kinetic energies and so on. Now, suppose in some way you are able to bring back the solar system to the state it, it was in at the first instant, and that after waiting two months you examined it again, and suppose that you were to discover that after two months it was in precisely the same state as it was the first time so that the initial state of the system, if you can bring back the system to that state, would invariably be followed by states uh, at different times, so that if there were an attempt to repeat these things, the pattern would unfold itself in the same way, we would say the solar system is a deterministic system. And I think this illustrates uh, what scientists have in mind when they do talk about a system being deterministic. And we could give a, a, uh, a more general account of it, uh, of what it is for a system to be a deterministic one. We will say, for example, a system S will be deterministic under the following conditions. Suppose it's in a given state at a certain time T1, and this means that a certain set of variables or properties characteristic of various elements in a system have certain values or determinate forms at that time. S is allowed to develop and after an interval of time I develops into a second state. S is then returned, never, never mind how, to the original state and after another interval again develops into the second state, which is precisely like it was the first time. And now, if S were to behave in this manner, no matter what state is taken to be the initial state, or what interval of time is specified, then we would say that S is a deterministic system with respect to that set of variables. Now, I'd like to point out just a few things in, in connection with this generalized account. In the first place, to say that a system is deterministic is to characterize it as deterministic relative to a certain specified set of variables. In the case of the solar system, I took such variables as positions, uh, velocities, uh, masses, energy, and so on. There are other characteristics, obviously, that the objects constituting the solar system have. For example, I have colors. Some of these things support life, others not. I mean, for example, there might be dis different distributions of living forms different parts of the solar system. None of these characteristics have been mentioned in my taking this system as an illustration of a, of a uh, deterministic system. Uh, so that the notion of a system being deterministic has to be relativized with respect to a specified set of variables or characteristic or properties. Secondly, and I think this is important, to say that a system is deterministic does not mean it doesn't it doesn't follow from the supposition that the system is deterministic that the various states of it are predictable. I emphasize this because a great many people have tried to assimilate the notion of determinism with the notion of predictability. Whether we can predict the future states of a system depends upon uh, certain local circumstances. For example, we must know what the laws of development are as well as know what the initial conditions are to which we apply the laws. But clearly, we may not know any of the laws, or if we know some of them, we may not know all of them. Uh, and uh, in consequence, to identify predictability with 
uh, determinism seems to me is to uh, distort the meaning of the term as it is widely employed. Now, the third point I'd like to m make uh, is this, that suppose we want to find that a particular system doesn't, yet you have some reason to believe that a system is not deterministic with respect to a given set of variables. Uh, for example, uh, you take a uh, pendulum uh, and find that, uh, uh, well, it doesn't seem to behave in accordance to certain uh, well-formulated laws that if you bring it back to what you think are its initial state and wait a certain interval of time, then it will appear in another state which is different from the state that it appeared on previous occasions when this sort of experiment was formed. Would this establish the, con uh, the, the claim that the system is not deterministic with respect to some specified set of variables? And I'd like to suggest that this is not the only alternative that one might adopt. For example, one might say, well, this system is not deterministic for the following reason. It hasn't been isolated from the influence of certain external elements. In the case of the solar system, all the other bodies are so remote that we can, for all practical purposes, regard the solar system as being isolated. But in the case of the pendulum, well, there might be all sorts of magnetic forces in operation from which we have not been able adequately to screen the pendulum, particularly if the bob of the pendulum is susceptible to magnetic influences. So it may be that the system is not deterministic simply because you haven't properly isolated it. Or secondly, it may be that uh, uh, you have not included in your account an enough set, uh, a sufficient set of variables. That is, for example, if I take the solar system again and consider only the variables of position and of mass, and suppose I wanted to uh, discover whether with respect to these properties the system is deterministic, then I think we would find that it is not deterministic in the sense specified, because in order to uh, come to the conclusion that the system is deterministic, you would have to introduce the variable of a velocity position and mass are not sufficient. So it may be that a system is det uh, is det uh, fails to appear to be deterministic simply because you have not taken into account a sufficient set of variables. Particularly, you may not have taken into account so-called microscopic variables, that is, variables associated with elements in the system that are not obvious uh, or they're not, uh, that manifest to the uh, untutored eye. Uh, so, uh, the claim that a system is not deterministic uh, cannot be easily established. It is true, of course, that a system may not be deterministic. That is, it is perfectly true that a system may have that characteristic which would lead one to say it is indeterministic, that it doesn't have this regular characteristic that I've tried to indicate. But this is not the, alter that, this is not the sole alternative. Now, uh, two other points I think are, are important to bear in mind. In the way in which I, have to tr I try to set up uh, a generalized definition of a deterministic system, despite the illustration that I have used, I've taken an example from physics, but I've tried to couch the general definition in such a fashion that the variables are not required to be of any particular kind. They could be physical variables. They could be biological variables. They could be psychological variables. That is, the notion of determinism is not associated necessarily with dealing only with a certain set of characteristics of things, namely those that we call physical. As far as uh, uh, trying to apply the notion of determinism to living systems or to psychological systems or to social systems, it is all equally applicable to them. But your kind of variable that you will be employing might very well be different in the different cases. The other point to observe is that there is no assumption in the definition that the only kinds of changes that can take place between variables 
or the only kind of influence that one variable can exert upon other variable is in terms of impact or collision or contact. The ordinary view, I think, of a deterministic system is, certainly as illustrated by uh, some of these quotations, is that you have a, a deterministic system if something somehow grabs hold of something else and by contact and collision and impact makes it move. But there's nothing essential in the notion, there's, there's, there's nothing in a, in a notion of determinism which essentially requires changes taking place only in virtue of contact. And that uh, as far as uh, the generalized definition, it might be like Aristotle's conception of a moveless mover, uh, which moves in the same way in which the loved one moves the beloved. Such a system also could be a deterministic one. Now, the one remaining point I'd like to make about determinism before turning to some of the applications of it is to ask very briefly, what is the cognitive status of the principle of determinism? The principle in its most general form could perhaps be rendered as follows. Given any set of variables, there is a system such that within that system one can regard uh, that there is a system such that that system is deterministic in respect to those variables. So that, for example, uh, in terms of current uh, views on physics, the uh, disintegration of atoms cannot be given a, a causal explanation, at least we do not know of any, but the principle of determinism would say that well, here are certain kinds of changes taking place, and if the principle of determinism were sound, it would say, well, maybe we haven't discovered such a system, but what the principle asserts is that there is some system, properly taking a suitable set of variables, which we may not yet have discovered, so that with respect to those variables, a particular kind of happening is determined by the values of the variables involved. Now, if one thinks of the general principle in this fashion, I think there's one unavoidable conclusion which one must come to. First of all, the principle certainly has not been conclusively established. And why not? Well, because there are a lot of things we don't know about the world. That is, we're ignorant about tremendous areas, and in a sense, the more we find out about things, the more impressed we are about how little we do know so that we cannot really assert that uh, the principle is true in the sense that we have now established this beyond any possibility of doubt. This is the first point. The second point is that the principle is incapable of being disproved for the reason that I've already suggested, because despite the fact that a great many physicists today or may uh, uh, maintaining that the behavior of atoms is essentially indeterminate or that there are no determinate conditions for the dis disintegration of atoms, of course, they would say, well, yes, we don't, or haven't found any, any uh, deterministic explanation for this behavior, but clearly the fact that we haven't succeeded thus far doesn't prove that there may not be one and that we have not simply been clever enough to get the right answers. As the important point, it seems to me, is that the deterministic principle is neither capable of being decisively established nor capable of being decisively disproved. And so, of course, if this is the status of it, you say, well, we don't know really whether it's true, and we don't know whether it really is false. We are incapable of establishing it as true. We are incapable of establishing it as false then what's the use of it? And I'd like to suggest very briefly that it seems to me that the, princ the principle of, of determinism can serve as a kind of a guiding principle, as a methodological rule which codifies one traditional goal of scientific inquiry. That is, things happen, we want to know why they happen, and we are conducting our inquiries on the assumption that if we are lucky, if the task is not too difficult, we might be able to get an answer. So in effect, as I view it, the principle of determinism is far less a thesis about the universe 
and then it is a program for the conduct of the enterprise of science. Let me turn now to the question, what is the relevance of determinism for human action? Now, a few words of explanation of what I mean by human action. I think uh, this is quite an agreement to what, what I think that we ordinarily would understand by talking about human action. It seems to me that when we talk about human action, we usually mean some form of behavior for which a human being can properly be said to be responsible. And which is often, though not invariably, the outcome of deliberation and explicit choice or decision. So that when we say that a, an individual has acted, rather than just behaved in a certain fashion, we are tacitly assuming that he could have acted differently from the way he did. Thus, we may deliberate between alternative opportunities that are presented to us. We may entertain reasons for accepting one rather than another of these alternatives, choose one of them rather than the others, even though we could have chosen the alternative we have actually rejected. For example, we might deliberate whether we should give arms to a beggar, contribute to a charitable organization, join a political party, should we or should we not marry and have children, though knowing that one is suffering from hemophilia and the like? I mean, these are sorts of things that we associate with human action. Even when we are doing something without first deliberating, for example, lighting a cigarette, moving one's legs when walking home from work, one doesn't deliberate about these things. These doings are human actions because we might entertain reasons for doing or not doing them so that the reasons were of the proper sort we might have abstained from those actions. On the other hand, we do not count as examples of human action the human heartbeat, nor in general a sneeze or a cough or having a dream or exhibiting a knee reflex, since in these cases we could not have done otherwise than we did even if we had the strongest reasons for behaving differently. And so it's customary in discussions of this kind to distinguish between behavior which is the result of something that happens to us and behavior which we ostensibly originate. Thus behavior which a man exhibits because, as we say, he was co he is coerced into doing that thing or over which he has no effective control does not count as an instance of human action and is thus not a manifestation of human freedom or of man's free will. Now, it's been frequently claimed that uh, if you suppose that determinism is warranted assumption, this is incompatible with the reality of there being such things as actions on the part of human beings, not behaviors, but actions. It's argued that if human behavior were determined by causal conditions, what a man does would have to be considered as the outcome of circumstance, so that a person's apparent action will have been ordained by natural law and any judgment of it will be as idle as a judgment of the rain for falling or of the stars for holding their courses. In other words, if everything we choose to do were determined, and this is the way the argument can be expanded, what we do would be something that we are obliged to do, and therefore, since we could not do otherwise, we would not be free, and hence we would not be really acting. Now, uh, one consequence that is drawn from this is that uh, uh, if you believe in determinism, then of course all questions of judging people, particularly using moral language and appraising their conduct, really doesn't make sense. And so it has been said, uh, I'll take one example out of an in number of others, uh, uh, I'm briefly quoting, it says, nobody denies that it would be stupid as well as cruel to blame me for not being taller than I am or to regard the color of my hair or the qualities of my intellect or my heart as being due principally to my own free choice. These attributes are as they are through no decision of mine. 
if I extend this category without limit, namely the category of determinism, then whatever is, is necessary and inevitable. To blame and praise, consider possible alternative courses of action, damn or congratulate historical figures for acting as they did, becomes an absurd activity. If I were convinced, so this writer goes on, that although choices did affect what occurred, yet they were themselves wholly determined by factors not within the individual's control, including his own motives and springs of action, I sh should certainly not regard him as morally praiseworthy or blameworthy. Now, to this kind of a criticism of, or, or this sort of an argument uh, alleging the incompatibility of determinism and the reality of human freedom, it is sometimes uh, retorted by way of rejoinder that, uh, well, to be sure, under given circumstances, if a man has made a certain kind of a choice, uh, including other things uh, involved, uh, that the man couldn't have acted, having chosen to act in a certain way, then in point of fact he did act. Nevertheless, so the attempted rejoinder runs, uh, I could have acted differently from, my, from the way that I did act if I had chosen differently from the way that I did. And so the claim is that uh, it is not true that according to determinism uh, I could have not, I could not have acted differently from what I did. The counterclaim is that I could have acted differently from the way that I did act if I had chosen, in some cases at any rate, to act differently. Now, this uh, rejoinder obviously will not satisfy the critic of, the, of, of, the ter of the determinism because his rebuttal then simply will consist, but how about your choices? Aren't these themselves uh, the consequences of causal conditions? And if so, then the choices that you actually make are choices which under those circumstances you had to make and so that you couldn't have acted differently because you couldn't have chosen differently from the way you did. For example, a contemporary philosopher discussing this issue uh, says the following. He says, it's not nonsense to ask whether the causes of my action, my own inner choices, decisions and desires are themselves caused. And if they are, then we cannot avoid concluding that given the causal conditions of the inner states, I could not have decided, will, chosen, or desired otherwise than I in fact did. Let us suppose that an ingenious physiologist can induce in me any volition he pleases simply by pushing various buttons on an instrument to which I am attached by numerous wires. By pushing one button, the physiologist evokes in me the volition to raise my hand. By pushing another button, he in induces in me the volition to kick. And my hand rises and my foot kicks in response to these relations, to these volitions. This is the description of a man who is acting in accordance with his inner volitions. But it is hardly the description of a free and responsible agent, so this writer continues, is the perfect description of a puppet. And so we conclude that determinism is not reconcilable with two fundamental items that according to him are the data on which the whole discussion rests, namely that human behavior is sometimes the outcome of deliberation and the second type of datum is that in these cases it is sometimes up to me what to do. That is, if I deliberate and think that the evidence is strong on one side or the other, it's up to me as to what, I'm going to, what, what is to be done and not to something else. And so the general picture here is this, that the assumption of uh, there being causal conditions for uh, the human the behavior or the, act the act activities of the, human, uh, of, of the human organism really are incompatible with certain apparent and generally accepted facts about human beings, that human beings uh, 
are capable of deliberation, that they genuinely deliberate, and that they can initiate actions where the initiation is something which is up to them. Now this is one widely accepted argument against determinism, and it certainly has the form of a reductio ad absurdum. The argument is made for the following steps. It first attempts to show that if determinism is true, then men can never be truly said to act, but only to behave. Secondly, the argument takes the assumption that men are not generally responsible for anything they do, that they never exercise freedom of choice, that they never deliberate, that they never act in such a way that it's up to them how they act, that this assumption is taken to be patently absurd, and accordingly it is concluded that determinism must be rejected as false. Now, before commenting further on this argument, I'd like to consider one uh, other one. There are a great number of them. But the argument I'd like to consider because it's this argument that is really closely associated with the one I've just outlined, and uh, it is so focal in current discussions uh, that I think it'd be worthwhile to review at least some of the points. The argument, by the way, is by no means new. Essentially, it's already present in Aristotle, but it has been introduced into recent discussions by uh, the late uh, John L. Austin, a distinguished and perhaps the leading figure in recent years of the Oxford Philosophical Group, in a very influential paper that he published in 1956 called Ifs and Cans. Austin, uh, in this paper, calls attention to the fact that in one important sense of can, the statement, I can if I choose, does not mean that my choosing is a causal condition of my ability or of my power. For example, uh, there's a sense of if which doesn't indicate that you're talking about a causal condition. If I were to say to a guest of mine uh, whom I'm leaving alone for a while because I have to run an errand, I say, there's wine in the closet if you choose. Uh, obviously, I don't mean that his choosing is a causal condition of there being wine in a closet. Uh, his choosing is not a causal condition for the presence of wine in a closet. I mean to say something altogether different. So that uh, from the statement, there's wine in the closet if you choose, obviously one would be able to say, well, from this you can conclude uh, there's wine in the closet whether you choose or not. Uh, similarly, when we say, I can if I choose, there's one sense I can, which we would say, it follows from, I can if I choose, that I can whether or not I choose. As, for example, we would say, I can move my leg, uh, assuming that I'm in normal condition. So, it isn't that, uh, it, the sense in which I'm, I'm said to... Uh, uh, I'm said to have the power of moving my legs, or the sense in which I can be said, uh, which I say I can move my legs, is a sense of can, which is not to be interpreted as asserting, if I choose, then I will, but rather that I do have a certain capacity, or I do have a certain power. In a very famous footnote in this article of Austin's, he declares the following, let me quote this, Consider the case where, he's talking about himself, he's playing golf, he says, I miss a very short putt and kick myself because I could have hold it. It is not that I should have hold it if conditions had been different. That might of course be so, but I'm talking about conditions as they precisely were and asserting that I could have hold it. There's the rub. Nor does I can hold it, in this case, mean that I shall hold it this time if I try, or if anything else. For I may try and miss, and yet not be convinced that I could not have done it. Indeed, further experience may confirm my belief that I, have, that I could have done it that time, even though I didn't. 
But I tried my hardest, Austin continues, and missed. Surely there must have been something that caused me to fail, that made me unable to succeed. And this is a rhetorical question he's asking. So that I could not have holded. Well, Austin adds, a modern belief in science, in there being an explanation of everything, may make us assent to this argument. Namely, that if I tried and didn't succeed, it's because there was something different about the case. But such a belief is not in line with the traditional beliefs enshrined in the word can. In the traditional beliefs, a human ability or power or capacity is inherently liable not to produce success or on occasion, and that for no reason. And so that there would be essentially uncaused, uncaused actions. And later on, Austin declares that the attempt to interpret arguments, uh, interpret statements like, I can or I could have done something different from what I did, in a sense I could have done something different had I so chosen, an argument that Austin rejects in the fashion that I've just briefly suggested. Uh, Austin, commenting on arguments of this sort, declares that these arguments fail to show that determinism is true, and indeed, in failing, go some way to show that it is not true. Determinism, whatever it may be, may yet be the case, but at least it appears not consistent with what we ordinarily say and presumably think. Uh, there are more extended uh, versions of this argument, and I would like, uh, again, very briefly to expand the argument as Austin has given it, and then finally comment on it. Uh, for example, a, uh, essentially the same point is made in a a paper by a colleague of mine at Columbia, Professor Richard Taylor, in a paper that he published in the Philosophical Review in 1960, a paper called I Can, and he makes essentially the same point in a little book on metaphysics that he published, I think, sometime last year. Uh, Taylor, in these various places that I've just been mentioning, is concerned with the idea expressed by I Can when the phrase I can occurs in such context as I can move my finger. Where to say I can move my finger implies neither that I have some special training nor some special strength nor some special opportunity. But simply say, well, I, I, I can move my finger. And what he tries to do in this, uh, the article and in, in this little book is to show that the idea of I can as a expressed in these locutions, uh, that this idea is irreducible and that in, in particular it cannot be analyzed in a way in which one analyzes uh, what uh, are sometimes called uh, hypothetical causal statements, such as are illustrated in a statement like, the stone is so hot that it can fry an egg. Now compare the sense of can in a statement like, I can move my finger with a sense of can in the statement, this stone is so hot that it can fry an egg. Now, in this latter case, this is something that one might characterize as a uh, uh, hypothetical causal statement. Namely, it says something of, in effect, would say something of this sort, that if an egg were placed on this, this stone at this time, the egg would be fried. And this seems to be the content of the statement, the stone is so hot that it can fry an egg. And the effort that uh, Professor Taylor makes in his article and elsewhere is to show that the sense of I can in connection with human action, such as I can move my finger, cannot be assimilated to causal statements which we use in connection with inanimate objects such as stones and, and uh, uh, eggs and the like. Now what are the grounds for saying that the can of human agency, uh, 
uh, does not express the idea of causal capacity. Uh, a number of reasons are advanced. I have time only to mention one of them. Uh, if you consider the statement, uh, the stone is so hot that it can fry an egg, and if I try to translate this in terms of, uh, as a causal statement, if an egg were placed on the stone, then uh, the egg would be, would be fried. Here I can state e exactly uh, some antecedent condition which is related in a definite way with a consequent, namely the frying. That is, placing the egg on a stone is the antecedent condition which is sufficient under these circumstances to produce the effect, namely a fried egg. Now, suppose uh, one attempts to do this for the statement, I can move my finger and try to render it by a subjunctive conditional, namely, if there should occur within me a certain unnamed event or state, then the finger motion would at once follow as a causal consequence. I mean, this would be a, an attempt to show that I can move my finger can be handled in exactly the same way as the statement, uh, the stone is so hot that it can fry an egg. Now, this suggestion is rejected uh, on the ground that uh, it really doesn't render uh, the sense of I can move my finger because uh, in this proposed translation, we are really not asserting any definite, any, any, any causal connection between any definite occurrence. We say, the proposal is, if there should occur within me a certain otherwise unspecified event or certain state, then the finger motion would at once follow as a causal consequence. But now, what state? If somebody were to suggest, well, of course, your muscle would have to contract. Well, very well, if we say, yes, a muscle would have to contract, but who does the contracting? And Taylor would say, well, it's I will contract it. And then, of course, we would say, well, then, I can contract my muscle. But then I would reintroduce the notion of I can in exactly the same form which I try to dispose of it. And so for this reason, he concludes that uh, any attempt to translate the statement, I can move my finger, or can uh, use the word can used in a context of human agency, uh, is uh, impossible that this is a quite a specific sense and that in point of fact uh, any attempt to give a causal account of I can in this sense is mistaken in principle and cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, supplied so that in one very obvious sense determinism would have to be rejected with respect to human action. Uh, now it's time I think that I try to say a little bit about the arguments and then uh, uh, indicate why it seems to me that uh, determinism is really quite compatible with uh, the assumption that human beings do deliberate, that they do make genuine choices and the like. Uh, I think it's perfectly true that uh, uh, when we talk about uh, a human being capable of be doing something, uh, this is a characteristic that, uh, by and large, uh, cannot whether or not the sugar is going to be dissolved. On the other hand, when we say of a human individual that he can move his finger or uh, he can swallow food uh, and the like, uh, we don't mean simply that he has a capacity, but uh, that it's up to him whether he's going to exercise it. Water certainly, uh, it's not up to water whether it's going to exercise a certain capacity under suitable conditions. So that, prima facie, there are important differences. Moreover, uh, I think it's also true that uh, uh, most of, uh, of creation is not associated with the presence of something we might call thought or consciousness. That is, uh, things happen and things operate without their being aware of what they're doing, and this is so, sort of thing that is uh, 
associated certainly only with living things and certainly most unambiguously and uh, unquestionably in connection with, with human things, with, with human beings. Nevertheless, I think one might say, well, there are certain types of systems uh, which are inanimate systems and of which it could, I think, be not improperly said that they possess capacities and that without too great a stretching of the term, uh, whether those capacities are exhibited or manifested or not is up to the inanimate systems. The kind of systems I'm thinking of are not uh, the normal type of a system, but those systems which have a certain distinctive type of organization that we sometimes call self-regulative systems or self-determining systems, such as, for example, a house equipped with a thermostat so that despite changes in the external temperature, uh, uh, the system is so devised that uh, uh, the internal temperature of the house or the room will be kept within certain, uh, within a certain temperature limits, or of a torpedo uh, which is so constructed and has such a mechanism that when it is properly set, it will hit a specified target. And as a matter of fact, once it's fired, uh, all human intervention, we are, can, can very well assume, has ceased. And now, th despite the fact that the target changes position, tries to escape, uh, the to uh, torpedo will act in such a way that, put it in common sense language, it, it will try to hit the target. And whether it will or not, it's up to the torpedo. And so it seems to me that there are inanimate systems. To be sure, these are systems that have been created by human beings. But that's hardly to the point. Not the question of who created them, but what their characteristics are. That there are inanimate systems uh, which are self-regulatory which exhibit certain characteristics, certain dispositions, certain powers, and whether or not those powers are exercised is up to the system itself. Now, again, here we have to add the proviso. Yes, even in these cases, for example, the, the, the homing torpedo or the building or room equipped with a thermostat is not aware of anything. I mean, what we call consciousness is absent. And of course, if the whole point of the argument that is in connection with human agency, human beings are normally conscious of their actions, there's an, indis an, an, an indisputable difference. But this is not the issue. The issue is whether the sense of can in the connection with human agency is something that is so peculiar that there's nothing comparable to it in connection with inanimate processes. And so, uh, I would have to conclude that, in general, physical things as well as human beings have capacities or powers in pretty much the same sense. Not all physical things have capacities or powers so that we could properly say that it's up to them whether they will manifest those powers. But after all, this is not a requirement that all things should possess a particular type of, of power. The point is that there appears to be no, nothing distinctive or, or, or unique in connection with human agency that would require one to say, well, now, this simply means and that human capacities in this respect are inexplicable in terms of the type of analyses that uh, uh, a science interested in finally the causal determinants of human action gives, that is, this type of illustration certainly does not establish the uh, uh, impossibility in principle to give an explanation, even though at the moment it may very well be true 
to say that we don't know, that if we ask, well, now how do you move your muscles? Uh, certainly we wouldn't say, I, I move my muscles by first uh, sending an electric impulse. We are unaware for the most part that we have electric impulses. And if, even if we were, then suppose we were to ask, well, now how do you send this electrical impulse? And we say, well, we won't know the answer to this. Perhaps sometime we might. Uh, whether we are aware of it or not is anyhow irrelevant. Uh, the point is that human beings have these capacities. How they have them, how they manifested about many of these things, we are in woeful ignorance. But uh, the presence of ignorance itself is hardly an argument to show that these are, in principle, inexplicable. Now, let me turn finally to the point I've really, uh, been coming to, uh, the compatibility of determinism and human freedom. It seems to me that those who claim that there is an incompatibility are very often, if not always, con uh, uh, are guilty of the confusion that is so frequently generated when terms that have acquired a certain fairly definite sense or meaning are given an extended but surreptitiously enlarged uh, domain of application. For example, the argument which says that, uh, well, look, if our choices themselves had uh, causal conditions, then we wouldn't really be making a choice. In that case, we would really be compelled now, we normally say that a man is making a choice when he's doing what he wants to do, in contradiction to doing what he must do because he's compelled to do so. Uh, the claim that if determinism were true, we could not do anything other than what we in fact are doing, however, alters the sense of could not. How would one establish whether I could or could not do certain sorts of things? Well, if you perform some act repeatedly, for example, can I run? Uh, I want to be sure that if I, as a matter of fact, am found in a condition of running, that this isn't, isn't just a, an accident or a fluke, that it is really a capacity that I have. So suppose now that I try this on repeated occasions and find that I really can run. So it's correct to say that I could have run to catch a bus even though I, I didn't actually run, I just walked. Uh, so there's a sense in which it would be correct to say I could have run even though I didn't. And this is the sense of could have, namely, that I have demonstrated that I have the capacity for it. Now those who deny this are using such a standard of adequate evidence that it becomes logically impossible to show that we ever can do anything that we are not actually doing. That is, when we say of an individual that he cannot do something or he could not have done something, if, for example, we say a man could not have uh, been present in Chicago at 10 o'clock since he was uh, in Washington at five minutes after 10, and how do we establish this? Well, we do this on the basis of repeated experience. We could say, obviously, that a man could have been somewhere where he in point was not because we have established uh, the fact that he possesses a certain capacity by a repeated set of trials. But those who argue that I could not have done anything but what I actually did do are now using could not in such a way that it becomes logically impossible to establish that anybody could have done anything other than what he did. And thereby, you're simply altering the sense of could or could not. The second point is the one that I've referred to earlier, namely that those who think that there's an incompat incompatibility uh, between determinism and human freedom are guilty of the fallacy of identifying the notion of explaining something with explaining it away. My example of, of, of Eddington tried to illustrate this. But let me offer a, a more relevant example. Again, uh, uh, let me quote from a recent writer 
whom I shall not name this time because uh, I think he is really very guilty of this uh, confusion. He says, if I believe that something not identical with myself was the cause of my behavior, some event wholly external to myself or even one internal to myself, such as a nerve impulse, volition or whatnot, then I cannot regard that behavior as being an act of mine unless I further believe that I was the cause of that external or internal event. The supposition that we sometimes deliberate and that what we do as a consequence of deliberation depends upon us rests upon nothing more than fairly common consent. These data that we take as our starting point might be illusions. It might in fact be that no man ever deliberates but only imagines that he does. That from pure con uh, conceit he supposes himself to be the master of his behavior and the author of his acts. Certainly men are sometimes mistaken in believing that they are behaving as a result of choice deliberately arrived at. If it is sometimes false that we deliberate and then act as the result of a decision deliberately arrived at, even when we suppose it to be true, it might always be false. And so the suggestion is this, that though we appear to have this capacity of deliberating and of acting upon our deliberation, this might really be an illusion if determinism this, this would be an illusion if determinism were true. Now, it seems to me that this is guilty of the same kind of mistake that Eddington is guilty of when he contrasts the reality of the common sense table with the reality of the scientific table and says it's the scientific table that is real. Because if one were to consider seriously this suggestion that well, yes, we appear to be deliberating, we appear to be acting upon our deliberation, but all this might really be an illusion. And why might it be an illusion? Well, because though sometimes people are mistaken in believing that they are, are really deliberating, for example, a man who is acting under hypnosis uh, may think that he is doing this, so to speak, out of his own volition, and yet we say, well, in this case, certainly he's been conditioned to, 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 to act in this way, and he has the illusion of deliberating and acting accordingly. Yes, it's perfectly true that uh, sometimes you are mistaken, but then the suggestion is that, uh, well, if it, we can be mistaken sometimes, we might be mistaken always. Now, this obviously really puts an altogether different face upon uh, the whole supposition. What would it mean to be always mistaken about the supposition that we are deliberating? That is, how could one always be mistaken about the supposition that one is deliberating? Clearly, one establishes whether one is deliberating or not deliberating, whether one is acting uh, or not acting on, on the basis of deliberation, not by, first of all, deciding whether determinism is true or not, Surely one, one has empirical ways of settling the question whether an individual deliberates or doesn't. One doesn't, first of all, <coughs> have to come to a conclusion about determinism. The argument, as I presented it, said, well, you really are not sure whether you're deliberating or not until you settle the issue of determinism. If determinism is true, then, you're never, then you may never be deliberating. But this is surely grotesque. We can surely decide on good empirical ground that an individual is deliberating, that he's not simply acting under the compulsion of various sorts of neuroses. And once we establish the fact that an individual is, is, is uh, deliberating, then should we discover the fact that there are causal conditions for his deliberation, this would not alter the fact that he has deliberated. Any more than uh, do we impugn the substantiality of the common sense table when we discover that it is made up of electrical particles and that there are relatively large regions of emptiness between them. The common sense table possesses all the characteristics that it does normally is said to possess, just as the person who is found to be deliberating and acting freely possesses all the characteristics that he normally is said to possess 
even if uh, we, should, we should discover, although we do not certainly at present know, what the determining conditions for his actions are. Let me say, just in conclusion, uh, why the question of a certain degree of clarity on this perennial problem seems to me to be important. I indicated that I don't believe that determinism is a demonstrable thesis. And I think also that if it's construed as a statement about a fundamental basic character of everything whatsoever that taken as a, such a thesis, it might be false. Uh, on the other hand, I've been, I, I've been defending determinism against certain types of criticisms because were those criticisms, as I think mistakenly accepted as sound, there would be a strong likelihood that premature limits would be set on a possible scope of scientific inquiry. For as I understand determinism, it is a guiding principle, a formulation of an ideal of science. Uh, an ideal which consists, I mean, the ideal being that of a search for explanations as a quest for trying to find out the conditions upon which the occurrence of events depends. I don't for a moment doubt that the dogmatic adoption of various special forms of the deterministic principle have often been hindrances to the advancement of knowledge and certainly that there's been much iniquitous social practice and much doubtful social theory that had been defended in the name of particular versions of determinism. And nevertheless, so it seems to me to abandon the deterministic principle itself is to withdraw from the enterprise of science. And since I think to withdraw from the enterprise of science is perhaps the most dangerous decision that anybody can make because it really put an end to an expansion of knowledge and the possibility of expanding the scope of, a liberal, uh, of liberalized civilization, this seems to me to be the real enemy. I mean, he attempts to curtail it. And uh, I don't believe that however acute is our awareness of the great variety and the richness of human experience, however sensitive we may be to fuller development of human individuality and however much we would despair having this somehow crushed in the interests of uh, advancing knowledge, I'm not sure that our best interests, rather on the contrary, I'm, I'm sure that our best interests would not be served by stopping all objective inquiry into the various conditions which determine the existence of human traits and actions, because in this way we would, I think we would be shutting the door to the progressive liberation from illusion that can come from the achievement of an increased knowledge of the causal conditions of human action. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Nagel has uh, said that he would consent to a question period, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, just ask them directly of him, and he will call on you individually. Are there any questions? Is, may I ask a question? Is it permitted to smoke? Certainly. Or at the uh, Homo sapiens, or uh, 
or certain category of Homo sapiens? What would be your guess? I, I wouldn't dare to guess there. That is, I, I'm not sure, for example, uh, where even in, a, in the human individual, in the development of the human individual, something that we would say free will begins. That is, I don't know exactly at what point uh, uh, human beings begin to deliberate and to be uh, responsive to uh, questions of logic and questions of evidence. That is to say, this is when you begin to deliberate. Now, whether any of the animals... Uh, other than man, are capable of deliberation, this may be a mooted question. And I don't pretend to have the answer to it. That is, of course, there are all sorts of, of tales about uh, uh, some animals being very clever and they're deliberating and so on. I mean, these uh, talented horses that can count and uh, so on. I'm not sure whether they really do. And I, I believe this would be fairly uh, generally accepted opinion that it's extremely risky to uh, characterize these uh, 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 living organisms as having what for short I've called a free will, namely choosing on, as, a, as a consequence of deliberation. May, maybe they do have it, but... Uh, for instance, uh, say, if Spensky, you uh, considered that something like the will is given very small percentage of homo sapiens. Uh, 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 well, I'm not as... It's a theory that, that free will exists, but uh, uh, not of uh, every uh, being and not of every uh, homo sapiens. Uh, well, I'm not quite as snobbish as that. Uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, anybody who... Uh, uh, reflects and, ha and, and is faced with alternatives and uh, you present him with, with, uh, uh, with reasons why uh, this alternative is preferable to that and in response to that, uh, he's engaged in deliberation. Now it seems to me that this is by no means a rare quality as Uspensky on, on your report uh, uh, claims it is. Uh, at least, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. I have no idea whether it's deliberating. Well, maybe so. Uh, I, I, I can only, uh, I, I hope I remember the story. It's a story that Bertrand Russell tells somewhere about two Chinese sages who were crossing a bridge, uh, a river, and one Chinese uh, sage says to the other, look at the fish, how much they delight, how much delight they take in disporting themselves in the waters. And the second sage says, and how do you know they take delight? And then the first one says, and how do you know that I don't know but it, <laughs> I don't know uh, uh, whether uh, 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 insects uh, are really deliberating when, as we say, we, they're hesitating. It's so easy, obviously, to, to uh, read into certain kinds of actions uh, uh, things that really don't belong there. I think it's been a, 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 a great... Uh, 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 development in our understanding of various sorts of, of uh, living forms, not to impute to them characteristics that we undoubtedly find in the case of human beings. It's very dangerous to infer this. That is dangerous in the sense that uh, it's logically unwarranted. Yes. Well, but how do you draw this conclusion about human beings? How do you draw the distinction? It's so far difficult with animals. Uh, uh, with about observing the behavior of human beings? How do you Well, uh, look, it's pretty uh, clear that uh, in order to engage in what we call deliberation, you would have to have something like a language. It may not have to be uh, quite the kind of language we have. Uh, there's a, a language which is not just a, a system of signals. For example, uh, bees uh, 
send signals to their mates uh, by performing a certain kind of a dance in what direction uh, the honey lies. Now, this is not a conventional language in the familiar sense. That is, these are just signals uh, uh, to which uh, the, 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 the animals respond. But I say, well, one evidence that human beings uh, deliberate is that they're using language. Now, to be sure, not everybody who uses language is uh, uh, always deliberating. But now, how, do, how does one discover, for example, that a person is acting in such a way that he's acting under some sort of a compulsion? For example, there are kleptomaniacs. How do you distinguish kleptomaniacs from those who are not? I mean, there's, there's some people who steal who are not kleptomaniacs. And uh, uh, you can discover, you, you can, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I, I'm not sufficiently trained in this, uh, th this specialized area to really, uh, you know, spell out the things. But look, children sometimes uh, steal. Uh, are they kleptomaniacs? No, because you can instruct them. You can tell them such and such are the consequences. Do you want this consequence or do you want that consequence? And they will respond. But the reason they respond is because you're influenced. What does that make any difference, uh, that, that they respond to an influence? The, the, the prima facie facts are this, that if there are some uh, systems, animate or inanimate, uh, which uh, respond in such a way that they do not go through what we call this process of weighing alternatives. Uh, uh, that is, if they don't go through that process, this is not a case of deliberation. That is, how, how does one know? Uh, how does one know that uh, uh, some proof that uh, somebody writes out for you has been the result of a good deal of trial and error and try this ploy and try that ploy, you run into a stone wall and nevertheless you finally come out with, with what seems to be a correct proof. Uh, certainly we say, well, such things take place. I mean, mathematicians spend their lives doing this kind of a thing. Now one might say, but look, maybe the mathematician simply responds to various kinds of signals and stimuli and, and whatever uh, physical, chemical processes that might be going on in his body. Let's suppose this is so. Still prima facie, the mathematician acts in a way that it's very different from the way in which, for example, I act if somebody gives me a push and I fall. I mean, there's a prima facie difference here. Now, there are borderline cases where it's very hard to say. For example, uh, uh, th there are a, a great many uh, offenses that are committed, and then the problem is, uh, well, was the person uh, with, uh, uh, rational at the time he did this? Uh, was he in control of his capacities? In some cases, it's perhaps very difficult to say, but surely as a, uh, as a gross distinction, it's something that uh, you couldn't possibly deny because you yourself constantly are making just that assumption in the way you yourself distinguish between a person and say, well, now, he's really not reasonable, and this person is reasonable. How do you know? How do you, how do you tell the difference? To spell out the, the, the details, obviously, it requires a, a, a great deal of expertise in, in formulation. But that we do this is hardly questionable. Wouldn't you agree? Very much about the computer. What about the computer? Modern computer has Wiener. Uh, well, how, well, 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 how about the computer? How about the computer? Uh, yes, well, very good. I mean, uh, let, let's, let's consider the computer. You know, there's a, a uh, there have been attempts, as many of us I'm sure know much better than I do, to simulate human behavior uh, by means of computers. Uh, for example, Professor Herbert Simon at uh, Carnegie Tech uh, used computers to see whether they could not simply find out whether a certain answer to a problem is correct, that is yes or no, but, sim but even to construct proofs. He did the following. You might, be, you might find this of some interest. Uh, he did the following. He uh, uh, programmed the computer 
to uh, construct proofs for certain elementary theorems in logic. Uh, some of the elementary theorems that appear in volume one are why did Rust's Principia Mathematica. There is one theorem in Principia Mathematica, I forget now, it's number 20, something like that, which requires 30 lines in Principia Mathematica. This problem was given to the computer. It gave a proof in three lines. Uh, this result was uh, uh, phoned into Simon, and he said, "Well, if a machine can, uh, uh, just just this result, uh, just the fact that the computer gave a three-line proof was phoned into him, not the details." And he sat down and said, "I'm going to see whether I can construct such a proof." And he tried for several days. He didn't succeed. Well, they decided to send this proof to the uh, Journal of Symbolic Logic, citing the computer as a co-author. Uh, <laughs> uh, some reason the editor didn't have a sense of humor and rejected it. Uh, but now, it may very well be that after a point, uh, you, may, you may be unable to say whether uh, a, a computer really is or is not deliberating. I mean, after all, uh, you know, you can do the following sort of uh, thing. This, was, as a matter of fact, was suggested by one of the uh, parties in this area, the late uh, Professor Turing, an English mathematician. Uh, he said, suppose you are faced with the following situation. You're in a room, and there are two adjacent rooms. In one, there is a computer. In the other one, there's a human being. You send in, you don't know in which room, these are, and you send in questions, and then you get answers. Problem, will you be able, on the basis of the answers you get, distinguish whether the answer is given by a human being or the answer is given by a computer? Now, uh, I suppose uh, there might be some questions that uh, you might put which will enable you to, to, uh, to to decide, but you'd have to go pretty far before you can do this. I mean, if you might ask, for example, are you married? And uh, you might get the answer, in one case, uh, none of your business. Uh, now, from whom does this come? <laughs> or, uh, that is, it, it might be the human being who said this, and the, the other answer was, uh, yes, happily. Uh, it might be the computer. And how would you tell the difference? Uh, so, uh, I mean, the question whether a computer deliberates. Well, certainly, I mean, the, even the best of computers today is one that uh, is not equal to the sort of things that, uh, except in terms of speed. In terms of speed, of course, they, uh, they, they, they excel human capacities. But in terms of being able to handle complex problems, they certainly don't. What the development here might eventually be, Lord knows. I mean, my crystal ball is very dim this evening. I... Yes. Professor Nagel, your analogy between a rocket and an individual prompts me to wonder what consistency then demands of us whether we should initiate the practice of punishing the rocket that does not act in an approved fashion or whether we should do away with the practice of punishing individuals who act in some other uh, well, of course, this does raise a, a, a different uh, dimension, uh, a question of a different dimension, that is, the whole problem of what the rationale of punishment is.